got the great music on. I was saying, this is great, <laughs> the background music as we get ready to start. Tara, we're at 10 now, so I think you're kicking us off, so say go for it. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we still will have people rolling in for a few minutes, but we're going to get started. Um, we have a busy session planned this morning, and so we want to have as much time as we can to just dive right into it. I'll start by introducing myself. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Tara. I'm the executive director with the Waterloo Region Immigration Partnership. Very happy to be here today with our community partners and with those of you from the Children and Youth Planning Table for this Anti-Racism 101 session, Beginning the Journey Together. Um, I guess I'll start by situating myself. So I said my name is Tara. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a white Canadian woman uh, with French and Swiss German heritage. Um, we are here today for this training um, for the Immigration Partnership. It's part of our anti-racism commitment and our journey towards operationalizing anti-racism in our collective work. And we know that it is the same for those of you who are here with the Children and Youth Planning Table. Um, we know that everybody is at a different place in space when it comes to knowledge and practice of anti-racism. Um, and so through our, in doing this work collectively, we wanted to start with a 101 to make sure that we are all at a, have a same basic level of um, foundational knowledge when it comes to anti-racism as we move forward together. I'd just like to say a few words um, about our trainer today. Um, to introduce her, Evelyn Amposa will be leading us through our journey today. She is a PhD candidate from York University where she is doing research on anti-Black racism and its impact on Black and non-Black people. She has over 10 years of working um, in the community service sector and has most recently been involved in leading anti-Black racism efforts at the City of Toronto and with Toronto Community Housing. She has extensive experience training senior leadership as well as working with grassroots organizations who are doing anti-racism work. Um, and we're pleased to have her here today to help us in our practice as we collectively work at becoming anti-racist. I'd like to start with a territorial acknowledgement today. Um, and given that Evelyn is joining us from Toronto, we are going to start um, by acknowledging that Evelyn is standing on the land of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I'd also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We also acknowledge all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants, either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly forcibly displanted Africans, brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. Today, I pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. And I'll pass it over to Allison. Good morning, everyone. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you before, my name is Allison Pearson. I am the manager with the Children and Youth Planning Table, and we are so excited to be sharing in this space together today. Um, thank you, Tara, for that great kickoff to the session. Um, in terms of knowing me a bit more, um, parts of my identity is I identify as a white uh, cisgendered female. I'm also a parent of uh, two young kids. And I'm very um, excited to learn with you today, excited to share together and to carry on in this journey in a collaborative way with many partners across the system, right? As we all work together to um, discover and uncover ways that our systems can be anti-racist and we can address some real root cause issues. I'd like to share the territorial acknowledgement for those who are here as I am in Waterloo region. And we acknowledge that the land on which we're broadcasting from here today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. 
We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share the land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. We offer this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. Before we hand it over to Evelyn, a couple of logistics. Uh, we're asking folks to mute yourselves, keep your videos on if you can. It's wonderful to see people in the room. We're gonna be recording the sessions and the chat will be exported. We love for you to make use of that chat because we're gonna try to pull insights that we can take forward collectively. And so throw your thoughts there, your comments, your questions. You'll see there an invitation to start with sharing something you're grateful or hopeful for as we start the session. And finally, uh, stay connected with your, your colleagues today. You can choose maybe social media, um, and then also know those chat comments were on a uh, uh, on the back end, um, throwing stuff together in a collective document on the Google Drive. So we welcome you to pop in there if you're if you're interested as well. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Evelyn, I believe you're going to start sharing your screen. Yes, I will. Uh, let's see. Share. Okay, so I have this double screen. Um, so sometimes, okay, you can see my screen. Yeah, okay, I see a thumbs up. Um, and, uh, okay, so I can't see the chat or anything, so um, hopefully somebody will let me know if there's any urgent questions or anything in the chat. Um, I don't know why it's set up this way, but I can't see anybody anymore either. It's okay. Um, are you seeing the, um, the presenter's view or the, uh, like, are you seeing my notes or no? No, just your no. slides. Okay, perfect. I just don't know because I have the double screen, the, the dual monitor, so I'm not sure what people are seeing sometimes. Okay, thank you so much for having me um, and uh, for inviting me to do this session with the group. Again, my name is Evelyn Ampansa. Um, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am black, I am a woman. Um, I am also Ghanaian, I was born in Ghana. Um, and I also threw in mill millennial there. Um, and I tend oh. to throw that in because it kind of uh, helps to situate my ability to use technology, <laughs> um, which I think a lot of, which I think is interesting in this moment where, um, you know, there's a lot of managing the chat while also speaking, while also doing like a lot of technological things. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you again. Um, I'm gonna just go into some of the session goals for today. Um, and please just let me know if I'm talking too fast. I just wanna make sure I get through all the material and sometimes um, I don't realize how quickly I'm going through it. So um, if I'm going too quickly, please let me know um, and I will happily slow down. Um, so the session goals for today, um, by the end of the sessions, participants will be able to define anti-racism and racism including understanding how to recognize it and its different formations. Um, participants will also have an understanding of the history of racism in Canada through the use of Canadian and local examples, while also learning about the systemic and interpersonal manifestations of racism. I think a lot of times when we think about racism, um, we often get American US examples. Um, and so it's important for us to really localize, um, you know, how racism shows up in Canada um, historically and present day. Um, and I think somebody had also submitted a question um, around, you know, does racism really show up in big cities like Toronto? Um, and so through this presentation, I'm hoping I can sort of respond to that question while also um, give you an understanding of the historical um, and contemporary er ways in which racism shows up in Canada. Um, so we, all, we will also discuss stereotyping as it relates to racism, um, unpack biases we may unknowingly or knowingly have, uh, microaggressions, including the not so innocent, innocent things we say, and work toward recognizing sub subconscious and unconscious formations of racism. Uh, I know that's a lot to get done in about an hour and 40 minutes, um, but I'm gonna do my best. And hopefully I'm just gonna be able to begin you on this journey um, and maybe give you some insight um, to help you to continue doing the work on your own. Um, and I, as I understand, this is the first session, but you know, there, there's the possibility for us to have more sessions as well. Um, so I'd like to start off with this chart here. Um, and I like to start off with this chart, chart and, I, and I ask people to do a bit of a self-assessment. Um, where are you in this journey to becoming anti-racist? Um, this chart actually 
uh, allows us to place ourselves, right? Like as much as, you know, a lot of us are thinking about anti being anti-racist, um, sometimes the assumption is that we're all in the same place when it comes to this work. And so while our commitment to anti-black, to, to anti-racism might be the same, um, where we are in terms of this journey looks different for a lot of folks. Um, and so this chart is really useful. Um, it starts off with the fear zone and it says, I deny racism is a problem. I avoid hard questions. I strive to be comfortable. I talk to others who look and think like me. And then it goes into the learning zone. I recognize racism as a present and current problem. I seek out questions that make me uncomfortable. I understand my own privilege in ignoring racism. I educate myself about race and structural racism. I am vulnerable about my own biases and knowledge gaps. I listen to others who think and look differently than me. And then we have the growth zone. I identify how I may unknowingly benefit from racism. I promote and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist. I sit with my discomfort. I speak out when I see racism in action. I educate my peers how racism harms our profession. I don't let mistakes deter me from being better. I yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized. And I surround myself with others who think and look differently than me. This chart, um, you know, is really important for us in terms of like thinking about this journey and doing this work. Where do you place yourself on this chart if you had to do a self-assessment? Would you say you're in the fear zone, learning zone, or growth zone? Um, and once you've been able to kind of locate yourself, it's important to also ask yourself, are you always in the same zone? Um, are you in the same zone at work as you are in your personal life, for example? Um, because sometimes I find that people can be in the learning and growth zone at home, um, because they sort of understand racism. They are the person within their network that can educate other people. Uh, but at work, sometimes folks are in the fear zone because it's hard to see how racism shows up in our work, right? So this, we, I often get this question from folks who work in, for example, like finance, right? They'd be like, I don't really understand how racism impacts finance or how racism impacts like payroll or different things like that. Um, and so it's interesting the, the ways that we can actually be in different zone in different places um, at home or at work. Um, and other with our friends, et cetera. So it's important to kind of like understand where you are um, at work, at home, and all of these different places. And what does it take for you to get to the next to the next zone? Um, are we, if we're thinking of of those of us who are in the fear zone, it's not to say that you're in the fear zone because um, you know you don't believe that racism exists, but maybe you don't see how it shows up at work, or maybe there hasn't been a safe space created for you at work to actually ask difficult questions, right? So we see that in the learning zone, it says I'm vulnerable, but my own biases and knowledge gaps. It's very hard to show a kind of vulnerability at work, right? And so sometimes people are in the fear zone, not because they're not interested and don't have questions um, and are trying to figure out things, but it's because at work, it's very difficult to be in a vulnerable space that allows you to acknowledge your biases and your knowledge gaps, right? When we're at work, we're, we're, we're uh, expected to be experts in all of the work that we do. So even when we have questions, um, particularly those of us who are in leadership roles, it's hard to, to ask those questions. Um, it's hard to, for example, you see in the learning zone, it says, seek questions that make me uncomfortable. One of the, the biggest difficulties we see with this work is that, that it makes people uncomfortable to talk about race. But if we're not willing to work through that discomfort and ask those difficult questions and do some of the dif difficult work, it prevents us from getting to the growth zone, right? It prevents us from, from getting to that place where we can actually advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist, um, that allows us to speak out when we see racism in, in action. One of the questions I often get from folks is like, how do I be a good ally? Or how do I, how do I be an ally? Um, but these sometimes these folks are actually in the fear zone and in the learning zone. Um, and so it's difficult to be an ally if you haven't gone through the, the journey of being in the fear zone, being with your sitting with your own discomfort in the learning zone, um, educating yourself about race, and then being able to be in the growth zone where you can then speak out when you see racism in action. Um, it's difficult to, to, do, to speak out 
when you don't necessarily have the language to speak out yet, right? So I think a lot of us have been in situations where we've seen something wrong happening. Um, we know it's wrong because we can feel it's wrong. We just know it's wrong. Even on a, on a conscious level, we know it's wrong. But it's hard for us to have that language to talk about why it's wrong, right? So you've, we've often seen situations where somebody has said, you know, that's racist or that's not okay. Um, and then, you know, the other person's like, you know, I was just making a joke. Um, and then we don't have the language to explain to them how that joke is racist, how it's rooted in a stereotype, et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 at the point in sort of like doing this kind of exercise is to say, you know, locate yourself right? Have an idea of where you are in relation to this journey. And then think about what it is that you need in order to get yourself to the next phase of the journey. Um, and then also it's important to do a bit of an assessment of those that are around you, right? Uh, what does your team look like at work? Is your team filled with people who look like you, um, who think the same things that you think? Um, or is your team, do you have folks on your team who look and think differently than you? Um, and, you know, what resources do we have on our team that will allow us to go from fear zone, the learning zone to the growth zone, right? Are there people on our team that, that have an expertise in anti-racism that can let us, that can support us to get to the growth zone? Um, are most people on our teams in the fear zone? If so, what, what work do we have to do in order to get people from the fear zone to the learning zone, um, from the learning zone to the growth zone? Um, how does our team if most of the people on our team are in, for example, the learning zone or the fear zone, how does that impact the folks that we serve? Um, you know, what, what ways are we trying to mitigate some of that harm that might be caused by the fact that, you know, we're still in a place of learning, right? And so when you are in a place of learning, there is the possibility that you might, you know, do harm for other folks. Uh, you might be harmful um, to other people, particularly clients or customers. Um, so how do you mitigate some of that while you do the learning? Um, how do we acknowledge that we're in a place of learning and, and all of that kind of stuff? So I really like this exercise because it gets us thinking about where we are, where folks are, and what are the tools and resources we need? What is the information we need to get us from one zone to the next zone? Um, and so I'm not sure if there's any questions coming up about this, uh, this chart. Um, I can pause for just about one minute to see if anybody has anything um, urgent that they, they might want to share in relation to this, and then I'll go on to the next slide. I think we just have a, an observation from Tara, um, you know, about this being about a collective effort. We don't all have to start as experts. Um, it's really resonating for me as well. I'm yeah. just taking a moment to see if anyone has a specific question, perhaps sure. even as people think more about it. Yes, and we actually kind of return back to this piece sort of at the end of the, the, the presentation as well. So it's okay if there's, there's, no, there's not necessarily comments right now. But of course, it's really important to, to be generous with yourself um, and be generous with others. Um, who are not necessarily at the same place that you are within this work. The goal in, in sort of like doing this work is to make sure that we can all gain the competency and the language around being anti-racist in a way that's useful and sustainable. Um, if we're hard on people who are still learning, um, then, you know, you could possibly push that person back into the fear zone. Um, and, you know, it's not always that we have to be generous because there are folks who, you know, are intentionally trying to cause harm. But if somebody is in a place of learning and is trying, right, like we need to be sort of like cog cognizant that folks are trying and trying to support uh, people in their growth and their learning um, so that we can all get to a place where we see being anti-racist as all of our responsibilities um, and that, you know, it's something that we can all learn. Being anti-racist is something that we can all we can all figure out. We can all think about um, that we can all intentionally make part of our work. So um, I want to start off with just a quick overview of race and power. Um, so historically, uh, how we get you know these racial categories and the power that's associated with race comes from a European colonizers um, controlling people and resources of the conquered world. Um, and so then the power um, that, that was established through this process was then used to produce racial categories, right? And it wasn't just the power, um, uh, the, the production of those racial categories. It was also that the racial categories, um, the, the narratives about these racial categories were used to justify why specific people, you know, were less intelligent, uh, mainly racialized and Black people were less intelligent, or people who were further away from whiteness 
uh, couldn't be in control of resources or couldn't be in control, couldn't have autonomy. Um, so the so the production of those racial categories was there was also narratives and ideas about those racial categories as well that were produced uh, during this period of time. Um, there were laws that were created to govern the entire functioning of the system and laws that reflected the beliefs of these Euro European colonizers. Um, and again, the, these were all narratives that were created and utilized in order to, um, to solidify this hierarchy of racial categories, right? Um, there was the ability to determine which race had access to which resources, including land, employment, education. Um, and then creating a version of society that benefited Europeans. Um, and these historical conditions produced modern day relations. Of, uh, and the important thing here, and one of the things that I really want folks to really think about is that we have to think about the historical pieces in order to challenge what we know as normal, in order to challenge what we have come to sort of accept as, um, you know, things that just happen to exist. Um, some of these ideas, these narratives, they don't just happen to exist. Um, they were intentionally uh, created in the way that they are. And so understanding a history when it comes to racism is important because it allows us to, to challenge what we have just come to be socialized as normal today. Um, and so thinking about you know, the, the ways in which power was used to create racial categories and then that power was also used to create ideas about who these people are. Right. And that those ideas were intentionally created in order to uh, maintain um, control, right, to maintain control over resources and control over people is a really important part of this conversation. So what is racism? Um, and this is like a very basic definition of what racism is. Um, racism is any action or attitude, conscious or unconscious, that subordinates an individual or group based on skin color or race, it can be enacted individually or institutionally. So this is a basic, a very basic definition of racism that you could, that you likely can just get by Googling. Um, but I like to take this definition a little bit further and talk about racism um, as a, a system um, that punishes and rewards, right? And so we talked about this hierarchy of race um, the hierarchy of race put white at the top and black at the bottom and everybody else sort of like in between, right? But what this system does um, and what this action or attitude does is it rewards or it punishes based off of your proximity to whiteness. And that's one of the things that's really important about thinking about racism and thinking about these, these structures and systems that exist. They are systems that rewarded people who were closer to white uh, and punished people who were closer to black. Um, and so at some point within that system, um, it became a learned behavior that being closer to white meant you would have access to better things. You would have access to education, you had access to employment, you would have um, access to um, money, for example, to class, for example. Um, and so the closer you were to white, the more access you had, um, the more you were re rewarded by this system. And the closer you were to black, the more you were punished by this system. Um, and so what that tells us is that everybody becomes invested in this system because of the way that it rewards and punishes. Um, because of the way that it rewards and punishes, even folks who are closer to even folks who are closer to black um, still become invested in the system because we are all invested in the rewards of the system, right? And so um, what that tells us is like, the more we can, you know, be, we, the more we can get closer to whiteness, the more rewards that we will gain. And so it becomes a system that everybody's invested in, even if it's a system that punishes some of us, right? And so folks who are racialized and folks who are black, tend to be punished by this system a lot more. And by punished, um, I don't just mean like a physical kind of punishment, but I also mean, um, you know, uh, being restricted access, being restricted from having things, um, being restricted from land, 
being restricted from, um, you know, being able to even just raise your children, for example, if we think about um, the residential schools, right? Like there was a way in which the system said, if you were indigenous, you didn't have the capacity to raise your children in a meaningful way. And therefore they were taken away and put into these residential schools. And so again, that's an example of how the system punishes um, and how the system rewards those who are closer to whiteness. Um, and so in thinking about that piece, um, I really want us to think about how we then are invested in this system. Um, how then do, uh, do the, does the investment show up for us as individuals? How does the investment show up for you, right? So even once we can acknowledge that racism is a problem within our society, we still have to ask ourselves, you know, how am I invested in this system? Because at one point or another, the system does reward you, right? Depending on who you are, what you look like, how you sound, um, et cetera, the system does re reward you. So even if we recognize that this system is a problem for other folks in our in our society, we still become invested in it because it, it has rewarded us at one point or another. Um, and so I'm, I'm asking folks to, to do an exercise of thinking about how the system rewards us and therefore how are you invested in the system because it rewards you. Once we can sort of like have that kind of conversation, it will allow us to see, um, you know, uh, it would allow us to sort of like divest from that investment. It will allow us to say, you know what, like I see that I'm being, I'm being rewarded more than others because of my proximity to whiteness. Um, just checking the chat here, but again, I can't necessarily see it. Uh, is there any questions or anything about that piece uh, uh, before I move on? Okay. Uh, so, so these are some equations I'd like to share with folks, um, because I often get a question about, uh, you know, the difference between discrimination, the difference between prejudice, and the different difference between racism. So prejudice um, is, you know, prejudging people based off of their skin color, right? Um, so prejudice is based off of race. Um, and so race, prejudice plus power, uh, that manifests itself to, uh, through that systemic and systematically um, equals racism, right? So that it has to be race and power that equals racism. Uh, race, power, and the ability to act on that equals discrimination. And so what that means is if you're, um, if you have the ability to deny somebody a job, if you have the ability to deny somebody an apartment because of the race and the power that you has, you have that equals discrimination. Um, racism, so folks can be racist without the ability to actually act on that racism. Um, but then there are folks who are, uh, who have the ability, who are, you know, who can be racist um, and have the ability to act on that racism, which then equals discrimination. Um, and then we have race minus power, which is what equals prejudice. And so, you know, all of us can be prejudiced, right? All of us, um, if we think about it, Ha, so judge people based off of stereotypes, judge people based off of assumptions, judge people based off of, you know, what we think we know about them. Um, and that kind of prejudice exists for most people, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are racist um, or discriminating because you need to be able to act on that prejudice and you need to be able to also have power. And so if you remember um, a few slides ago, um, I talked about Actually, you know what, I realized I put it here. So I talked about race and power, right? So I talked about the, the importance of understanding how race and power like work together. So if we go back to this slide, it's important to see how power shows up in some of these definitions. Um, historically, groups that have been racialized, um, racialized black and indigenous groups um, have not had access to power in the same way that um, white groups have. And so what that means is that our ability as folks who are who don't have that power to discriminate or to be racist is not the same as the ability um, of as a system that reflects the beliefs of um, here's that slide right the system that reflects the beliefs of European colonizers um, or you know the that that European system that ensured that society was was created to benefit Europeans and so. We go back to the definition, which is, you know, this, this, this place where you see power continuously show up, 
Power is such an important thing to consider when we have these conversations. The power to create laws that reflect your beliefs, the power to act on those laws, the power to um, decide who gets what, all of those things are very important when we think about what racism is and what discrimination is. Um, if, if not, then we're just thinking about, we're just talking about prejudice. Um, and so when folks say some stuff like, you know, um, if I went to um, a country where I was like the minority, um, you know, I get this question sometimes um, from white people. If I go to a country where I'm the minority, you know, I would experience racism. And that is not necessarily true in that, you know, it's not about being the minor minority or the majority in terms of what determines if you're experiencing racism. It's really about thinking about that power piece, right? And so for a lot of us, um, because mo most of the world has been colonized, whiteness, still takes is still has power anywhere that folks go. So even if you go to a place where you are the minority, it doesn't necessarily take away that power that you have. Um, you still have that power in places even when you aren't the majority. So I wanna go into a few terms. Um, so bias, um, bias is prejudice in favor um, or against one thing, person or group compared with another. Um, usually in a way that's considered to be unfair. Um, and what bias does, again, is it's rooted in this kind of like stereotypes, these assumptions that we learn about people, um, these stereotypes that we often get from um, media or TV around who somebody is, um, what their skin color tells you about them. Um, and then what that does is it creates biases within our conscious and our subconscious. Um, and there is the ability to be, to have, to be anti-bias, to have anti-bias. And I've seen a lot of um, research and a lot of work on anti-bias training. Um, and if you sort of remember the first slide that I showed you um, around um, the journey to being anti-racist, one of the things um, in the learning zone and the growth zone is surrounding yourself with people who look differently and think differently than you. That is one of the most important things in terms of challenging the biases that we have. Because if you're constantly being fed information from media that tells you one thing about a group of people and you've had no relationships with those group of people in your personal life, your that bias is gonna show up in your subconscious. And so if we want to, you know, if we want to think about anti-bias and really confronting that, challenging those biases that we have, it's really important to ensure that the people that are around us look differently than us. Um, and think differently than us because it allows us to challenge that bias. Um, and then we have privilege, uh, a certain entitlement to immunity granted by the state or another authority to a restricted group, either by birth or on a conditional basis. Um, and so when I talked about that system that rewards and punish, I'm also think, talking about a system that gave folks who were closer to whiteness types of, types of privilege um, while denying those types of privilege to other people. Um, and then we have a right. Um, a right is an inherent uh, irrevocable entitlement held by all citizens or all human beings from the moment of birth. And sometimes we get confused when we talk about privileges and rights, right? Where folks feel like, um, you know, everything, um, things that have been have been granted because they are actually our privileges um, are considered to be rights. Um, and that's not necessarily true, right? And we see also that there are groups that because of their skin color are denied basic rights. Historically, for example, um, access to education um, or access to water access to, um, you know, livable, um, uh, 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 safe living conditions, right? These are all rights. Um, and historically, those rights have actually been denied to racialized Black and Indigenous people. Um, and then, um, you know, solidified for folks who are close who are white and closer to white, right? Again, so those kinds of that difference within the way the system rewards and punishes and how those things um, are also connected to privileges. And then we have learned behavior, which is language I really like to use a lot when I do this kind of training, um, because learned behavior is developed as a result of experience. And so if we have a system in place that rewards and punishes people based off of their proximity to whiteness, right? what we end up doing is that we learn that behavior. We learn, we, we come to expect you know, 
being privileged, being rewarded. We come to expect being punished um, or not being rewarded. And we learn that behavior and we internalize it. Um, and we learn, you know, uh, and, and that learned behavior becomes an expectation in terms of how we move in the world, right? And so we always move in different spaces based off of that behavior that we've learned. Um, and it's really important for us to think about what's the learned behavior that we have gained based off of um, the system that rewards and punish. What have we, what has that, that system taught us? And how have we learned a kind of behavior in relation to that system? Um, and then we have positionality which is where one fits in society. Positionality is connected to intersections, uh, which is a framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. Um, and really what that means is, you know, being, I started off the session by saying that I'm black and that I am a woman, um, and, you know, I mentioned that I'm a millennial, which gives you sort of an idea of what my age is, but all of those different things are all of my different intersections. Um, and that contributes to my, posi my positionality, which is where I fit in society. And again, I'm going to connect it back to the system um, that rewards and punishes based off of your proximity to whiteness. Um, but it's also based off of your proximity to um, being a man, for example, also based off of your proximity to being, um, you know, uh, what, your, what your sexuality is, what your sexual orientation is. All of these things are part of that positionality. And so we do have all of these multiple identities that then help in society, which again, connects back to the system that rewards and punishes. Um, so before I get into the next uh, section, sort of, I just want to pause to see if there's any questions around anything that I've shared so far. Allison, I'm not sure, or Tara, I'm not sure if there's stuff coming up in the chat um, that can be shared at this time that I can respond to. If not, I, I will continue. I think the chat, uh, you've, you've addressed stuff already in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're doing great, Evelyn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, it's often really difficult when you're presenting in this kind of setting. I'm like, what are people thinking? Are people thinking this person's out of control or what's going on? So um, I like to know that the, the information that I'm speaking about is resonating with folks, um, even if it's just by, with a thumbs up or something in the chat. Um, so thank you for that feedback. Um, so I want to talk, I want to move on and talk about race and racism in the Canadian context. Um, it's really, really important to understand how race and racism has shown up in our laws historically. Um, for most folks, laws are neutral. They're colorblind. Um, they, you know, we're taught to believe that no one is above the law, that our laws impact everybody the same way, that our policies and our systems impact everybody the same way. And so I like to do this exercise of kind of doing a historical approach in terms of how our laws have actually been very directly racist and very directly discriminatory um, against uh, various groups of people historically, right? So we have, for example, in the 1800s, 1885, um, persons of Asiatic heritage were prohibited from voting in BC. Um, as well as implement the implementation of uh, the Chinese Immigration Act, which imposed a head tax on Chinese immigrants. Um, this it was a $500 head tax. It initially started off as a $50 head tax, um, and it led to the government collecting $33 million, which in 2016 is $321 million. And so the, the goal of this head tax uh, was to curb um, and you know, stop Chinese immigration, uh, Chinese people from uh, coming to Canada. And so there was a period of time where, there, where the Canadian government encouraged Chinese immigration um, for Chinese, um, mainly Chinese men to work on the railroad, on the construction of the railroad. But once the railroad, um, once there was no need for that kind of Chinese labor, um, there was a head tax that was imposed, which was 50, it started off at 50, ended up going up to $500. Um, so if Chinese immigrants wanted to come to Canada, they had to pay this head tax. So you can imagine how much money that was in, in, the, in 1885. Um, in 1876, we have the creation of the Indian Act, um, where residential schools were established uh, by the government. Um, and the Indian Act did a lot of other things, not just residential schools. Um, and the last residential school closed in 1996. Um, and I think that's really important for folks to know uh, because a lot of times we think about these things as happening so, so long ago and having no impact 
day and we should just forget about these historical things. But the last residential school did close in 1996, which was not uh, too long ago. I'm sure we can all kind of remember 1996, right? Um, in 1910, uh, the Immigration Act, Session 38, allowed the government to prohibit landing of immigrants belonging to any race deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada or of any immigrants of any specified class, occupation, or character. Um, and this act was actually used um, to prohibit the um, immigration of, as you see at the bottom there, um, uh, prohibiting the landing of any immigrant belonging to the Negro race. So the idea was that anybody were, uh, belonging to the Negro race did not suit the climate and the requirements of Canada. Um, and so that was in 1910. Um, in 1912, you have um, an act passing um, the prevention, of the, the employment of female labor in certain capacities in Saskatchewan. Um, so, and it was also known as the white woman's labor law. Um, and you can actually Google this law and it will come up, um, you know, if you Google white woman's labor law. Um, and what this law did is it prevented white women from, from working for Chinese men. Um, it was a criminal offense for Chinese men to hire white women. Um, due to white women were vulnerable and needed to be protected from non-white men. Um, and uh, the statute was motivated largely by anti-immigration and racist attitudes and white workers' concerns about competitive pricing of Chinese goods and services. And so at the time, um, in the 1900s, white women's labor was some of the cheapest labor that you could get um, if you owned a business. Um, and so this law was intentional to, to, um, to prevent Chinese um, shopkeepers and owners from hiring cheap labor, which was white women's labor, but it was also under the, under the guise of protecting white women from Chinese men. Um, in 1914, um, we have the Komagata Muru, um, and this is um, a ship that landed in Canada. 376 people from India were detained on the uh, Komagata Muru ship for two months and then denied entry into Canada. And um, the, the important thing about this particular, um, uh, this particular incident was that it was connected to uh, the Continuous Journey Act. And so the Continuous Journey Act, though it didn't say specifically it would deny specific groups of people from coming to Canada, what it stated was if you came to Canada and it wasn't a continuous journey, meaning you had to stop for fuel or anything else, then you wouldn't be allowed entry into Canada. Um, and so um, that, that Continuous Journey Act was intentionally created that way to, to ensure immigration from places such as India because it uh, wouldn't happen because if you came from India on a, on a ship, you would have to stop um, somewhere for fuel, right? You couldn't just make that journey continuous. So that that um, the continuous jury law was intentional, and it was used to to um, deny entry of um, the of, of this ship, the Komagata Maru, in 1914. Uh, during World War One, Ukrainian Canadians were branded as enemy aliens. Um, thousands were interned, and 50,000 had to wear um, uh, special identification badges. Um, in 1939, Canada refused entry to thousands of Jewish refugees escaping persecution by Nazis. Uh, they were sent back and three-fourths of them died at the hands of Nazis. And actually, one of the most important um, uh, quotes of, from Canadian history comes out of this particular time period where uh, the prime minister at the time was asked, how many Jewish people would you allow into Canada um, as a result of the Holocaust, and he said, none is too many. Um, and he said that publicly. Um, he didn't say that to his close friends in secret or in private. Um, he said it publicly again. Um, and, and to me, that's important that he said that publicly because it tells us how um, commonplace and how socially acceptable this kind of racism was at that time. Um, and I always underscore this for folks because I think many people um, assume that the kind of racism that existed in Canada wasn't commonplace. It wasn't socially acceptable. It was a few people here and there. Um, but actually for the prime minister to make such a statement publicly saying none is too many tells you that this is something, this was a sentiment that resonated with most people in Canada at the time. Um, during World War, World II, 
uh, there was the forcible expulsion and confinement of Japanese people, uh, also known as the Japanese internment. Um, Japanese people's bank accounts were frozen. Uh, many Japanese people who actually were born in Canada and grew up in Canada were deported um, as a result of World War II. Um, and there was also the, the internment that was similar to the Ukrainian in internment, where they had to wear special identification badges um, as well. Um, and then I want to focus a little bit on anti-Black racism in Canada as well. Um, so uh, in 1962, we have the earliest documented occurrence of slavery in Canada. Um, and um, although the although the, the color democracy tells us that French introduced slavery in Canada as early as the 1600s, um, and it was not abolished until 1834. Um, in 1850, Ontario government introduces the Common Schools Act which allows for the segregation of African Canadians, um, meaning that we had segregated schools here and this policy wasn't eliminated until 1964. Um, in the 1940s, <clears throat> uh, South Africa sends representatives to Canada to study the Canadian system for reserves uh, for indigenous people. Um, and what this did was they used their findings from, our, from the indigenous, um, the reserve system that existed here to um, segregate indigenous people in South Africa into townships and homelands, right? So you have the South African government learning from Canada's indigenous um, reservation system. Um, in 1946, um, Viola Desmond, which is a name that most folks should be familiar with um, today, um, from, um, she was a black woman from Nova Scotia. She's currently on the $10 bill. Um, was arrested for sitting in a white section of a movie theater um, and spent the night in jail and was fined. And again, this is another example of how segregation um, existed here in Canada and was commonplace. So you had public places such as a movie theater that had whites only sections and sections for black people um, separately. Um, and so here's just a couple of ex um, some a newspaper article um, hundreds riot downtown after anti-racism protests. This article is from 1992, um, and um, it's an example of uh, the fact that even in the 90s, people in Toronto were protesting um, racism. Um, and very important that we understand this history, that it's not just with Black Lives Matter um, and different groups that we've seen to come, um, you know, sort of uh, come to uh, protest in the past few years, this has been historically, uh, racism has been historically an issue for a city like Toronto. Um, the second, there, second one there is an example of the Common Schools Act. Again, um, this act was used to segregate schools. Um, and then you have an advertisement here that was um, in, an, in a Toronto newspaper um, from the 1800s. Um, and you have, you know, this, this article states um, to be sold, um, a black <clears throat> a black woman named Peggy, aged about 40 years, um, and a black boy, her son named Jupiter, aged about 15 years, both of them the property of the subscriber. The woman is a tolerable cook and washerwoman and perfectly understands making soap and candles. The boy is tall and strong of his age and has been employed in, in country bushels and brought up principally as a house servant. They're each of them servants for life. Um, the price for the woman is $150 and the boy $200 payable three years um, uh, with interest from the day of sale and to be properly secured by bond, but one fourth less will be taken of money is, if money is ready. Um, this is signed in caps lock by Peter Russell, um, who Russell Street in Toronto is named after um, and from York, which is Toronto, um, February 10th, 1806. And again, it's really important for us to not even look, not only look at this example, um, this, this ad as an example of slavery existing in Canada, but also to see how commonplace it was, right? Because this is um, a person who owns slaves who was, is placing an ad in a newspaper. Um, this is a public thing. He's, he's, he's selling his slaves through newspaper, not through some sort of private sale behind closed doors, but very, very publicly. So again, it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that slavery wasn't just a one-off thing that existed in Canada. It existed um, in a very commonplace, uh, regular way, similar to the way that it existed in the U.S. Um, are there any questions uh, before I move on to the next slide um, or any comments? Uh, coming up. Thanks, Evelyn. 
I've been keeping an eye on the chat as I think Tara has lots of comments of appreciation for um, the definitions that you've given, the clarity with the definitions and that they're so easy to follow and really meaningful for folks. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, people saying, you know, they'd like this to be training that their whole team has, has, has a chance to be part of. Uh, mm -hmm. Tara asked a question in the chat about, you know, to what degree or is slavery history in Canada taught in schools? And, and some people have shared their memories or their reflections of maybe what they have or haven't had um, so I don't know if you if you want to speak for a moment about um, yeah on that one for sure so um, you know unfortunately uh, and I don't I haven't seen the the the, uh, the curriculum um, in a, in a while but I know that um, the last couple of years folks have been pushing for the curriculum to um, accurately reflect slavery in Canada as well as Indigenous experiences in Canada more accurately right but um, I, I, I don't think that those changes have actually happened. Um, and so we aren't taught that slavery existed in Canada in the way that it has, right? When we are taught about slavery, um, particularly in its relationship to Canada, the thing that we are taught is that Canada was a safe haven for, for folks who were enslaved, right? We're taught about the, um, the Underground Railroad. Um, we're not taught about Viola Desmond, but we're taught about, for example, Harriet Tubman, who is, you know, of course we should know about Harriet Tubman, but there are many folks, many Canadian um, uh, examples of folks who resisted, you know, slavery, um, who resisted segregation and all of those pieces, but most of the information that we have is very American. Um, and so when you have um, us being, you know, raised to, to, to learn about the Underground Railroad um, and its relation to Canada, you know, slave, folks who were enslaved following the Underground Railroad, um, Harriet Tubman as a guide, bringing them to Canada to escape, escape slavery, we're not taught that actually there was such thing as the reverse Underground Railroad, where folks who came here through the Underground Railroad um, went back to the U.S. because of the kind of racism that they were experiencing here. Um, and it's not to say that the racism, that, that they weren't experiencing racism in the U.S., but more so because they were, it was a racism that they were more familiar with in the U.S. And so uh, there was a reverse underground railroad that also took people back. And so I'm not sure, you know, what information our young people are getting these days through the education system around these pieces. What I do know is that it's often up to parents um, to do their own work <laughs> um, around educating their children around this piece, right? It, it, it becomes um, additional labor that a lot of parents have to take on to give their, their children other information when it comes to um, these histories because we're not being taught them. Um, and, you know, it's really important for us to, to know about these historical pieces, not because, you know, our goal is to say that Canada is a horrible place, right? Like that's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say we have this history um, that has been very racist. Um, and, and because we have this history that has been very racist, those same, that same kind of racism impacts how we see people and impacts how we treat people today, right? Like there's a direct connection between groups who have historically experienced racism and groups today who continue to experience racism or groups today who, 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 who see very negative uh, you know, even negative is an understatement, horrible outcomes, right? Like if we look at the outcomes for the indigenous community or outcomes for the black community, um, we know that, um, you know, indigenous and black, black children are more likely to be put in care, uh, more likely to be taken away from their families. We know that there's higher dropout rates um, in high school, higher suspension rates, higher expulsion rates, um, lower unemployment, more likely to live in poverty. Um, and we can connect those experiences directly to this history that exists in Canada. And so if we erase that history and we deny that history, then it becomes a thing where these people are facing these consequences or these outcomes because they are just bad at life, right? Like this idea that these groups are just bad at life, are just bad at managing things. And if we're being honest, everybody's bad at life, right? We're all trying to figure out this thing called life. There's no, there's no, um, there's nobody that has it completely figured out, but there are systems that are put in place that have been historically put in place that makes life a little bit easier for other people, right? That rewards other people and punishes other people. And, and it's important for us to reckon with that history if we're gonna try to change those outcomes, right? So it's really important for us to do this historical piece and to think about where did we start as a nation? Um, whose back was this nation built on? And how how is this nation continuously 
still benefiting from off the backs of those people. Um, and so it, it becomes a conversation about, you know, the, doing the work of thinking about that his, historical piece and connecting it to the, to the realities that folks experience today. And then being able to then say, you know what, like, how do we change our systems? How do we change our processes to actually take into account the history that these these groups of people have experienced. Um, and so when I say that, it, again, I'm gonna go back to this idea that our laws and our systems are colorblind, right? Like I've had somebody say something to me like, our school system, well, school's free for everybody. So why are black kids less likely to do well in school, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so again, it's people taking the very colorblind approach. Um, I've had people say, you know, you know, we know that outcomes for black women um, in, in healthcare are worse than for other women. And people say, well, health, healthcare is free for everybody. So, you know, what, what, like, why can't, why are Black women having a different experience when it comes to the healthcare system and et cetera? Um, and it's, it's because we've taken this approach that is very colorblind, which is like every, every, all of our systems should impact everybody the same way. But if you then look at the history of things and you realize, well, the systems were actually set up to reward uh, one group of people. And not only were the system set up to reward one group of people, the system was also set up to, um, to have ideas about other groups of people that then, that then um, you know, meant that they would experience, diff they would have different kinds of experiences. So if we understand all of that kind of history, it will allow us to get to a place where we're doing something different and understanding that our policies, um, our systems, you know, even things that we do that we don't think are a big deal, can be a big deal for groups that have been historically impacted differently. A really good example that I've, I've been sharing with folks recently is around the heightened um, levels of security presence in, com in regular places because of COVID and social distancing, right? So now if you go to the grocery store, um, you're more likely to see somebody who is security. Um, and that person's job is to ensure that people are wearing their masks, and our social distancing. But if we think about a history that has seen Black people be more over-policed, right? Um, be followed around in stores because there's this, this assumption that they're gonna steal, then you can think about how uh, uh, something that seems as neutral as having a security person to help with social distancing can actually have negative, more negative impacts on folks who are Black, can be very triggering, right? Can, can be like, well, now I'm going to the grocery store and I'm seeing security, and you know, I've been followed around by security before, or I've, you know, our communities tend to be over policed. So something very neutral actually has a different impact on groups that have a different history. And so it's really important to think about that. Our curriculum in school is not a neutral curriculum. It's a curriculum that tells black, indigenous, and racialized students that they don't belong here. Right? That's that's what our curriculum does. Our curriculum is very Eurocentric. Um, it reinforces ideas about Europeans. The only time we get to see black and racialized and indigenous people in the curriculum is when we're talking about multiculturalism or when it's Black History Month, um, which is extremely problematic because then it tells so then the impact the curriculum has on students who don't see themselves as black in the curriculum is one that, you know, is gonna be different than a curriculum that reinforces. Um, the value and the importance of whiteness or like a, Euro, a, a Eurocentric kind of approach. Um, and so those are all the things that we have to think about as we think about the histories and as we do this work. Just gonna check the time. Yeah, thanks, no problem. Alan. Yeah, you check the time there. We're a couple minutes before 11. There was uh, just two other points in the chat that I'll mention now and work them in wherever it fits for you. The one was, sure. uh, person was not sure if this would be part of your talk, but as people are sharing different resources in the chat, um, they're noticing that um, people would probably benefit from enjoying or um, understanding the history of Africaville in Nova Scotia and researching sure. that if they're not already aware of it. And another comment about um, how much progress has actually been made in this country. 1996 was not that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you know the the Africaville question is not something I deal with in this particular session because we don't have the time. Um, if we have some time at the end, I can revisit a little a little bit if if folks are interested. But yes, Africaville is very important learning in terms of um, the Black experience here in Canada, um, and uh, you know, and the the ways that that the law again was used to take that land away from um, Black people in Nova Scotia. Um, and, you know, this question about progress, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, 
scary considering that um, we're now again having these conversations and you have people who grew up in the 60s, for example, um, in the 50s when there was a lot of, you know, when Martin Luther King and uh, Malcolm X and even here in Canada, there were a lot of uprisings around race and, um, you know, and then somebody even brought up recently to me, Barack Obama and said, you know, I can't like seeing all of these things signaled to me a kind of progress, right? Like people really uh, look at symbols that exist and say, you know, we've made a lot of progress. We look around and we say, well, you know, I work, I have black colleagues or I see black people doing this or I have indigenous colleagues and so on. And so we take those particular, those individual moments to, to, to say that we made a lot of progress. But if we look at our system, and if we look at the outcomes that exist for these for, for groups of people, we will see that we actually have not made that much progress at all. Um, in fact, the ways in which people are experiencing life today can actually, because um, if we look at the economic situation and all of those things, it's, it's actually a little bit worse today than it is. Um, and so when, you know, this summer, when um, the the protests in the U.S. that also prompted pr protests here um, around police brutality as they come up, it tells us, it reminds us that, you know, we actually haven't made that much progress at all. Um, if we look at the history of police brutality in Canada, uh, police violence, um, it happens here. Um, Black people in Toronto are 20 times more likely to be killed by police um, than other groups of people, um, five times more likely to be carted. Um, all of these kinds of um, uh, uh, outcomes tell us that we really haven't made that much progress. Um, and so there are moments of progress, right? And this is the thing, there are moments where it, it appears like there's progress. And I'm not sure if when we see those things, then we kind of say, okay, we're at a better place. Um, and so maybe that's the issue. We have to stay diligent when it comes to this work. Um, but also I find that the, the difficulty is that most of us have not done the work of examining how we are all invested in this system, right? You know, I started there. I started by talking about we are all invested in this system that rewards and this system that punishes. And we cannot get to a place where we're actually making progress until we all reckon with that piece. Um, there, there, there's a need for us to, to think about that in a very intentional way, um, because in order for the system to change, we have to, we, our investment in that system has to change. If, we're continue, if we continue to invest in the system because it rewards us sometimes here and there, that, that system is not gonna change. And so we have to think about that, what that investment looks like in order to move us to a different place. Um, so I'm gonna move on, uh, I'm looking at the time. And I want to start talking about manifestations of racism. Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I would just uh, have a question that it's not for answering for everybody else uh, at this point because um, you started well. We're not saying Canada is a horrible country, right? It's a great country. And then what you're telling us, and and I expected to hear it, is that in some respects things are not improving. Um, so, question for all of us that I'm struggling with, Alexandra here, right? Social Development Center. Mm is that I am observing in the systems in many regards and regarding racism, that the starting point is always, we are doing extremely well. Mm. That's the starting point. And it becomes a non, like it makes it a non issue. So it's like, how can we tweak or you know improve here and there? The other line of thought that is rarely in a public um, conversation is actually we, we're really, really not doing well. If we just mm -hmm. listen to the experiences, uh, we need to completely turn the world upside down if we want to make any real progress. So it, it's a it's, um, thinking question that I have. And, and as some would say that if we start from positive, we will have better results. We will get uh, white people on board and privilege people on board. And, you know, um, and the other one is no, until we name it, uh, we will not move ahead, but then it disengages. So those two streams seem to be very important. And a wise mm -hmm. woman told me once, um, if you're born white, there's no opting out of racism, just to what extent you are mm. dealing with it and helping systems change. So mm. do we, like, what are you employing in your day-to-day -day work and life, as, as, as everyone said, private and, and professional? Which uh, approach do you favor? And if you do, what proof you have that it is actually working. So thank you so much for, for taking us through uh, from one to the other, right? Uh, yeah. Thanks. No problem. Thank you for sharing that. 
that's something that I've actually um, was having a conversation about just a couple of days ago, because one of the things is that um, we tend to look at equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives um, that do actually improve scores, right? So what you, what you will see is like organizations will hire a more diverse workforce. For example, um, they'll have, you know, uh, more racialized people, more black people within the workforce. Um, and there are all of these initiatives that are aimed to increase the numbers in terms of who we see around us. But just because the numbers of who we see around us um, have increased, it doesn't mean the experiences of those people are, 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 they're having good experiences, right? Like, do people feel valued when they come to work? Are people dealing with, and we're going to deal with it in a few slides, but are people dealing with microaggressions when they come to work? Are people feeling like they can, you know, um, climb the ladder when they come to work? Um, are people feeling safe? Do people experience harm when they come to work? So even if the numbers, right, like we're doing well because we have, you know, 10% of our workforce reflects the diversity of Toronto or whatever else it is, um, that doesn't mean the experiences of those people are, are well, because if you ask a lot of those people, they will tell you that they experience like a lot of racism when they actually go to work, right? People will tell you they hate going to work because they, you know their, their colleagues ask them very stupid um, racist questions um, and not intentional, right? A lot of times not intentional questions about, you know, where are you really from? Uh, you know, why is your hair different all the time? Or all of these questions that are, are you know, it seems like a, a, just a kind of curiosity or a way to be in relationship with people, but it, it is very offensive, right? And so we will get to that place where we talk about those things. But I think that what you're pointing to is that unspoken workplace environment that often exists that we don't know how to deal with, right? Because it's just like, it's unspoken. It just exists somewhere. So it's not in our policies. It's not in our equity and diversity initiatives. It doesn't show up in these places because it's just an unspoken workplace environment that most people are just silent about. Um, and so what does, that, what does that mean in terms of how people are actually experiencing the workplace? If it's an unspoken, um, you know, unspoken uh, environment, but also like an unspoken sort of like, you just have to deal with it because it's just the way that things are. Right. And so nobody's actually naming it. Nobody's actually speaking to it because it's just assumed that we can't do anything about it. And it's just the way things are. Also, it's invisible. Right. It's very invisible in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to get into the manifestations of racism that are going to move us a little bit through the, the presentation. Um, and so there is the direct manifestation of racism. So there are those who expressly expose racist views as a part of a personal credo. Um, this is actually today sort of very rare. This is more of a historical um, kind of manifestation of racism where you had people who are just very directly racist who don't care and will you know, say they don't like black or racialized people. Um, they might say they don't like immigrants or there's too many immigrants here. Or we're letting in too many immigrants or refugees and they use that kind of language. Um, and, and, you know, this is a very direct kind of form of racism um, I've experienced and I've, I've, I've spoken to folks who've experienced, you know, they, they get on the bus and people will change seats not to sit beside them and those kinds of things, right? So those are direct um, ways in which racism manifests itself. There's the unconscious. And I think a lot of people are in this place where there are um, uh, some uh, subconscious uh, negative attitudes towards other people that are based on stereotypical assumptions um, concerning people of color. Um, and then there's the systemic and the institutional, um, probably the most pervasive uh, racism exists within our institutions. Um, the systemic racism is a product of indiv individual attitudes and beliefs concerning black, indigenous, and rac racialized people and fosters and legitimizes those assumptions and stereotypes. I'm gonna return to the unconscious um, for a bit before I move into talking about stereotypes. It's really important for us to think about, you know, what do we know about Black people? What do we know about Indigenous people? And what do we know about the different types of racialized people that exist within our society? And where did we get that information? Right? Because if I asked you to sort of start thinking about what you know about people, the first things that come to your mind, if I was to say, you know, a thug or a gangster, if I was to say, you know, a terrorist, if I was to say a doctor, if I was to say... Um, a teacher, right? The images that come to your mind, right, are, are guided by our subconscious. And what's guided by our subconscious is the information that we're constantly being bombarded with in relation to different types of people. And so if you don't have meaningful relationships in your life with people who don't look like you, um, 
all you're going to know is the information you're getting from media, right? The information that you're getting from um, um, the news, for example. And we know that those stories can, are often, not even often, they are always very one-sided about groups of people. And so if you are not in a place where you are lucky enough to be around people who don't look like you, the only information you're getting is information you're getting from media, from our school system. And we've already determined that our school system doesn't give us a lot of information. Um, the media doesn't give us a lot of diverse information and neither does the news. And so if that, though that's the only information that you're getting, um, then your subconscious is gonna be impacted by that. Your subconscious is gonna be impacted by the fact that Every time you turn on the news, um, you know, there is somebody's talking about uh, like a shooting or a gangster or something and the person is black or when we're watching movies and there's a terrorist plot or something like that, the person is brown or the person is Muslim um, or like all of these different pieces. And I'm not saying that, you know, for example, the media necessarily only gives us one sided stories about um these groups of people. An example I often like to share with people is um, the media often or movies often tell us that um, people who are part of like the mafia and stuff like that um, uh, are Italian, right? So you have like the Sopranos and you have all of these other narratives. Um, but for me, I grew up and I, and I went to school where I had a lot of Italian people around me. I had a, teachers that were Italian. I've had meaningful relationships with, with people who are Italian. And so that challenges that narrative that I get from the media, right? It tells me that actually not all Italian people are part of this kind of, um, you know, this kind of narrative that I get from the Sopranos. It tells me that, um, you, like, I've had, a, like, you know, one of my favorite teachers who influenced me so much in my life was Italian. And so to have that experience with somebody who didn't look like me, who cared about me, who nurtured me, who showed me love, um, who supported me in my growth, that counters that narrative that I have about Italian people that I get from the media, right? And so in my, in my subconscious, right, I have a lot of different ideas of what it means to be this person, this kind of person, I'm from this kind of culture, because I've had meaningful experiences with people that, that look differently than me, right, and so for a lot of us who are racialized and Black and Indigenous, we are forced into these relationships because, uh, you know, whiteness dominates our society, so we're forced into those relationships that challenge the stereotypes that we learn anywhere else, right, but for other, for other folks, right, who are not forced into these, these kind of relationships, right? I often ask people, how many of you have had black teachers, have had, you know, black, um, um, have black friends, have black people around you in different capacities and meaningful capacities. And a lot of times people don't, don't have those kinds of experiences. And it's not a fault, it's not to say like you're a horrible person because of that. But what that, what that means to me is that the ideas that you're getting from media and from the news are the only things that you know about black and racialized people and that means that's the only way you're going to be able to engage right and so this is a huge issue that we really have to think about in terms of what's the information that we're getting where are we getting this information um and you know how do we get information that tells us something different about these folks um about other groups of people so that's the piece around the unconscious that i really like people to think about um where are you getting information about Black, Indigenous, and racialized people? Where are you getting information um, about people who don't look like you? Um, what do you know? Have you asked yourself, why do I know this particular stereotype? Where did I learn this stereotype? Have you done the work of unlearning that stereotype, right? Because once you know you know it, you, you don't just learn something different. You have to unlearn it in order to allow you to actually act on the different thing that you learn, right? Because I think a lot of us go through a process of learning new things, but we haven't actually unlearned the old things that we know. And so they still show up in how we treat people, regardless whether we want it to show up or not, because it's just the way that our minds and our subconscious and those kinds of things work. Um, so really important to do that piece and to think about that piece. Um, and then again, the systemic and the institutional, which is sort of like how I started off in terms of um, how our, our, our policies, our laws, and our systems have historically been racist. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on that piece right now. Um, I'm gonna move on, unless there's anything in the chat that I need to deal with. Okay, I'll take that as a note. Um, a and so, of, 
there's two concepts, oh, yeah. Evelyn, but maybe we might come back to them. Just some interesting okay. things in the chat. I'm noticing about the um, uh, concept of reverse racism and your thoughts on that. Also noticing a comment about um, perhaps working towards a goal of being colorblind individually and in our systems. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on is, is that the end goal? Is, is that where we're ideally aiming for? Sorry, did you say um, a goal, the goal of being colorblind? Right. So working together to create an environment. So a suggestion mm -hmm. of we need to be working together to create an environment at an individual and system level um, where we are colorblind. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious your reflection or thoughts on that as, a, as an end goal. So uh, I think that to, that I don't think that's a realistic end goal because um, in being colorblind, it ignores the histories that, that exist that mean that our policies and our procedures impact different people differently. Um, and so I think that we need to move towards a model that is, um, uh, what's the word? Um, that, so there's, there's, there's a definition, there's a, um, uh, a, a concept that I really like to talk to people about, which is called targeted universalism. Um, we don't get into it too much in this present, actually we don't get into it at all in this presentation, but targeted universalism is, um, sorry, my dog is doing something strange. Sorry, um, <laughs> working from home. So targeted universalism is, a, is an idea that says that we can, ach we can achieve universal um, equity for people if we take targeted approaches, right? And so, um, and targeted universalism actually already exists all around us without many of us knowing, right? So for example, um, I'm not sure if in Waterloo, I'm assuming you probably do have, uh, but you know, um, buses that lower. Um, you can also think about um, um, uh, escalators and elevators and all of these kinds of things. These are targeted approaches to provide equity for folks who are experiencing any kind of mobility issues, but that targeted approach um, allows us to achieve like a, a kind of universal like equity, right? So it's a targeted approach. Um, its focus is on ensuring that people who have accessibility issues are able to access things a little bit easier. Um, but what it does is, is it, it, makes things, it makes things a little bit more equitable and equal. So it's a targeted approach that allows things, that allows for like a, a, a more universal equity. I'm not sure if that's like resonating or making sense for folks, but I think that's the model that we should be working towards. And what targeted universalism also tells us is that when you're able to remove barriers for one group of people, a targeted group of people, it also removes barriers for other groups of people as well. Um, and so again, the example with like the escalator, the elevator, the buses that lower, right? So even though those things are meant to remove barriers for folks who are um, maybe like living with a disability or having mobility issues, um, it removes barriers for other people as well. Mothers with strollers, um, people who, you know, you might have had an injury one day and then you can't take the stairs. So it ends up moving barriers for other folks as well. And so it's a targeted approach that then benefits other groups of people as well. Another example I like to share with people around targeted universalism um, at, from a systemic kind of a systems kind of level um, is if you think about um, uh, like standardized testing. Um, so let's say before you get a job, you have to do this kind of standardized testing. Um, uh, research has shown that standardized testing is actually um, very race can be very racist and provide and and be a barrier for folks from racialized communities. Um, and so, if you remove um, that standardized testing as a requirement to accessing a job, it actually benefits other groups of people who you know might just not be good at writing writing those kinds of tests, right? So you have a targeted approach that still benefits other people. Um, and so I don't think the colorblind is the goal. I think it's targeted approaches. That's the goal. Um, targeted approaches that ensure equity um, for other people, you know, and, and until a time where race um, and the history that exists no longer impact the way that people are experiencing life today, I think that's the best, that's the best direction for us to go in. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if, if, if the person who uh, made that comment, if that's helpful at all. Um, and you can look up that targeted universalism approach if you want some more information on it. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, Are you wanting yes. at this point 
comment on reverse racism or save that for yeah. later. Is that is so what is it is it a question specifically about it or just what are my thoughts around reverse racism? I think it uh, your thoughts on the concept of reverse racism, how you feel about that. Yeah, um I I say it like very kind of like plainly for folks that reverse racism is not a thing, right? Because again, back to the definition that I shared in the beginning, racism requires a level of power that you know we've already established that folks who are racialized black and indigenous oftentimes have been disenfranchised and don't have the same kind of power um and so it's 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 impossible for these folks to be race to be to engage in reverse racism if you mean like racism that's from like black people towards like white people for example right like it's it's not it's it, you can be prejudiced right you can hold these views but the power to actually act on that racism um on a systemic level um through laws through policies and through those things it doesn't exist for groups that are have been disenfranchised so it, it's not reverse racism it's it's likely prejudice that you're referring to which is like um a, sort of like what i said in the beginning is um uh is judging people based off of you know an assumption about them um but that judgment doesn't necessarily result in some sort of like just like some sort of power and maybe i can give you an example that will help you to think about it so we can be prejudiced about not just folks that are racialized. We can be prejudiced about a lot of things, right? We can be prejudiced about um, folks who are short, folks who are tall, uh, folks who are, uh, the beauty industry is very, very like um, uh, prejudiced or like pushes a lot of prejudice around, you know, people that don't fit our standard, um, um, standard beauty, beauty standards that exist in Canada and that exist in the world actually, and not even just in Canada, but um, so, those are their kinds of prejudices that we attach with the way that people look, right? But that, but we we, we can't necessarily, um, you know, withhold things from folks um, in the same way that like folks who are racist or who have power can with, oftentimes withhold things from people because they are black or because they are indigenous or because they are racialized in um, these other ways, right? So, and and also like prejudice can also work in a way that is um, uh, that can can actually be a benefit, right? So even though it, it oftentimes works out in a negative way, it can also work in a way where it's like, well, you assume that this group of people is good at something, right? And so you oftentimes will like, they're more likely to be hired for a certain kind of job because there is an assumption that they are good at something. So prejudice is not, it's mostly negative, but it's not always negative. But racism um, is, is something that is always negative because it, again, it's about that system that rewards and punishes. And so when you think about reverse racism, I think you have to ask yourself, does the group um, that you're thinking about, do they have power to act on whatever it is that they are, you know, uh, yeah, whatever the situation is, is there a power, is there power there? Um, there's a power dynamic that always exists in all of our relationships. Um, and so it's always important to, to, to locate where that power is coming from in order to understand what's happening within that situation. Um, and so if the laws, if you have the laws that back you, the systems that reflect your power, that reflect your beliefs, that support, you know, your way of life and all of those things, then that's where the racism comes in. But if the systems are not there to support, you know, what your beliefs are or those kinds of things, negative beliefs or prejudices, then it's not racism, it's something else, which which most of the time is prejudice. So I, I hope that that maybe uh, makes things a little bit more clear. If not, I can maybe return to it at the end. Um, again, maybe take a, a more specific question. Um, so I'm gonna move on, it's 1122, and I think we have about 30 more minutes or so. Um, and so, uh, Stereotypes are not just stereotypes. Um, stereotypes reflect and reinforce beliefs, attitudes, and prejudices, um, and oftentimes result in discrimination. Um, and stereotypes come directly out of systems of power. Again, um, like I was saying initially, um, the stereotypes that you know exist about people come directly out of these systems that that were intentional about saying this group of people are unintelligent and therefore should not have access to control, to controlling these resources. Oops. Sorry, can you hear me? I don't, it looks like I pushed the button here. We can hear yeah, you. Okay, can hear. okay, I don't know what happened. Okay, um, so 
the the stereotypes um, that existed, <clears throat> uh, they are ideas that were used to actually restrict access, right? And to, to take away um, and to punish um, and to say, you know, one of the, the examples I often like to give people is that if we look at the system of slavery, where um, there was the intention to um, use one group of people who had something in common, which was their skin color, um, as slaves, right? This is transatlantic slavery. There are ideas that came out from that from that system um, in order to use that particular group of people as slaves, right? And so those ideas um, around um, what does it mean to be black or what does it mean to have that skin color was used to justify slavery. And that's where a lot of the stereotypes we know about black people come from. It comes directly from that system. Um, and so when we think that, when we say stuff like stereotypes are, are, are just stereotypes, it's actually not true because it comes from that system um, that, that, that says something about a group of people, that characterize a group of people in oftentimes very, very negative ways in order to allow for something else to happen to that group of people. So in order to allow, to allow for uh, Black West African people to be used as slaves, there were narratives that were created about who those people are. And really scary, those narratives still impact the way that Black people are treated today. And a really, really good example that I like to share with folks is that um, there was a study that was done with medical students. And um, the, the study said that, um, medical students um, were prescribing pain medication. I think it was like 80% or so were prescribing pain medication less for black people. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, as the, the, the person did their investigation, one of the reasons that they found out was that, uh, that, that medical students were doing this is that they believed that black people had thicker skin. Um, and because they, they believed that they had thicker skin, they, be they believed that they felt pain less. Right. And so that stereotype about black people having thicker skin, um, not needing sunscreen and all of those things comes directly out of that system of slavery that said because black people have thicker skin, they are more likely to they can endure more pain. Right. Those things are directly connected and today still show up in our medical system. Right. So it's really important to think about these stereotypes and what these stereotypes were meant to do historically and how they continue to show up today um, and impact people's lives today. Right, so um, the impacts of stereotyping, um, because we have all of these stereotypes that exist, we oftentimes fear people who are, stere who are you know, stereotyped in these ways. We are more suspicious of them. We scrutinize, we monitor, we surveil them. We could try to control and contain these groups of people, the discipline and the punishment that comes along with this. Um, the impact of stereotyping, it's very difficult to make that separation. And this is what I was sort of like get, um, getting at initially as well, is it's difficult to make the separation between what is a stereotype and what is actually true um, when we don't have access to different information. Um, I oftentimes like to give people this example as well. Um, so in, in movies, right? Again, I'm gonna go back to the movies and stuff. In movies, any of the TV shows that we watch, serial killers are often white men. Um, and so even though that's the message we get a lot of times from media, we, most of us don't fear white men or are not suspicious of white men um, as if they are serial killers. Why is that? Because uh, we have so much other information that tells us that that's not all white men are, right? And so that particular uh, stereotype, you know, that gets perpetuated through the media, it doesn't result in the same kind of treatment of white men because we have different uh, examples, different ideas of what it means to be a white man that challenges that. But if on the media, even if it's just a narrative that comes up, we're constantly hearing that, um, you know, this group of people is like this, then it's gonna result in us acting on that information. It's gonna result in us acting on that information and making it difficult for us to separate, you know, what's real and what's not, what's true and what's not, right? It shows up in our minds and our subconscious, it impacts the way we see other people and it impacts how we do our work, whether we like it or not, right? Like if I asked a lot of you, if you believe in a lot of these stereotypes, you would probably say no. But just because you consciously don't believe in those stereotypes doesn't necessarily mean that they don't show up in the way that you treat people especially if you don't have access to different information. So it's really important to think about that piece as well. 
Um, any questions about stereotypes or comments about stereotypes? Um, because I'm going to move on into microaggressions. Okay. Um, so microaggressions, um, and I have here nothing micro about microaggressions because though the word micro is in the definition or is in the, the word, microaggressions are not small. They're called microaggressions because they happen on an interpersonal level. So they, ap they happen between people and not on a macro level um, as in within systems. Um, and so that's why they're called microaggressions, but they're not small things. Uh, microaggressions are defined as everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, uh, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. They are more than just insults, um, insensitive comments, or, or generalized jerky behavior. Um, there's something very specific about microaggression. Uh, the kinds of remarks you say, the kinds of questions you ask, um, or actions that are painful uh, because they have to do with a person's membership in a group that's discriminated against or subject to stereotypes. And a key part of what makes them so disconcerting disconcer is that they happen casually, frequently, and often without any harm intended in everyday life, right? And this is one of the, the, the difficulties about microaggressions is that, you know, even if you're, if you are, you know, deploying a microaggression, most of the time, the person on the receiving end is not going to tell you. So oftentimes you don't know. So you are trying to be well intent, intent, intended, um, not trying to cause any harm, but the question or the remark or the comment that you've made to somebody is a microaggression. The way it impacts that person is, um, you know, negative, but they're not, most of the time, they're not going to tell you uh, because it's also very hard to name. And also when you try to name microaggressions for folks, they tend to tell you, well, you know, I was just joking um, or, you know, you're being too politically correct. You're playing the race card, right? These are often the, the, type, type, um, the kinds of responses that come out when you try to talk to somebody about the fact that they are, you know, what they're doing is a microaggression. And so it makes it very difficult for people to even tell you, you know, what that was, I, like, I didn't appreciate that. That was a microaggression, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then here I have some examples of things that, you know, uh, you know uh, are often said, right? So you don't act black, you don't act or sound black, you sound white. Um, you know, when somebody, you know, somebody asks that question, where are you really from? Can I touch your hair? You're pretty in, a, in an exotic way. So you must like curry or, you know, you must like jerk chicken. You must like Bob Marley. Um, all of these, you know, you must play basketball. Um, all of these kinds of comments. And I know it doesn't happen so just like um, isolated. They usually come up in conversation. But it, essentially, um, the issue with them is that they, they're, they're, they are connected to a type of stereotype that exists about this group of people. And again, like I said, the stereotypes come from these systems that rewarded and punished as well. So in engaging in the microaggression, you're also reinforcing these systems. And because microaggressions are so commonplace, um, so, um, yeah, just, just everybody sort of like engages in them in this kind of way. It makes it so hard because they're so pervasive within our society. Um, you know, I had a convert, I was doing a training once and I mentioned things to somebody, saying to somebody who's black or racialized, um, an immigrant, you know, you speak so well. Um, you know, that could be something that you feel is a compliment that you're saying to somebody, but is a microaggression um, because it reinforces this assumption that people who are not white shouldn't speak well, right? Should have, you know, if the person has an accent, right? This assumption that because you have an accent, you shouldn't be able to speak well and all of these kinds of things. And so even something like you speak so well is a microaggression um because of the assumptions that are associated with that right and oftentimes we don't tell people who are not um who are not racialized so we don't tell white people for example you know you speak so well right or you're so articulate that's not a compliment that we will that we say to people because there's an assumption that because they're white they speak well they speak english well etc cetera, etc cetera. um and a really interesting sort of like um example of that too is if you think about people who are from like the uk um the united kingdom kingdom or like who are british for example who also have accents right but we don't say to them like you speak so you speak so well or i'm surprised you speak english this way etc even though they have an accent 
but you would say to somebody who has an accent from somewhere else, okay, well, you speak so well, um, even though like you have this accent and some of those pieces. So that's also very interesting. And then you think about how that actually manifests within our system. I know a lot of people who uh, migrated here from the Caribbean, um, from Ghana, for example, um, who have accents, but in places like Ghana and places like Jamaica, et cetera, because of colonialism, the first language is actually English. But when, they, when people come here and they migrate, they often, um, as children, get put in ESL classes, not because they don't speak English, but because they have an accent, right? And so there's a way in which like this, 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 this kind of thing, this kind of assumption that, you know, what do you sound like? Uh, how do you speak English? And even though we say you speak so well as a compliment, they're actually connected to this history that says groups of people who come from different parts of the world should not be able to speak this way. And so it's actually not a compliment and can be an insult and can be insulting for folks. Um, any questions or thoughts? Um, I'm going to go into sort of like navigating microaggression uh, for a few minutes. I'm just rounding them up right now, Evelyn. Maybe if you keep going, we'll okay. come and address sure. them at the end. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I'm going to leave about like 10 more, 10 minutes at the end for just some questions and conversation. Um, so it, it's okay for you to save those comments there. Um, so with na navigating microaggressions, um, it's important to really identify where not only you are on the journey of, of being anti-racist, that chart that I initially showed you, but where the person is on that journey. Um, because it's important to understand, like, how do you talk to somebody about the fact that they're engaging in a microaggression if that person is in the fear zone or if that person is in the learning zone? I think it's a different approach that you would need to take with each of those people. And it also requires a different level of expertise to talk to somebody who's in the learning zone or talk to somebody who's in the fear zone. I think sometimes, oftentimes, we're in the learning zone trying to talk to people who are in the fear zone, and we don't necessarily have all of the language of somebody who's in the growth zone to be able to do some of that work, right? And so sometimes, especially if you notice there's a lot of microaggressions on your teams, um, maybe it's important to bring in an expert, somebody who's in the growth zone to do a session with your team about the microaggressions instead of just like as an individual um, trying to address that, especially if you're somebody who's in the learning zone. Um, it's important to address intent versus impact, right? So a lot of times people will say, well, I didn't mean it that way. Um, okay, I, I understand you didn't mean it that way, but here was the impact of your actions, right? So if you tell a joke and people don't laugh, that joke is not funny. So it didn't have the intended impact. Uh, so it's really important to address when you're talking to people, you know, the I, I get that you were just trying to maybe start a conversation. Um, you, you, get, you get that uh, you were just trying to make a joke, but the impact of what you said um, was that, you know, it made me feel like offended or whatever. So important to address the impact versus the intent. It's important to talk to others around you to establish a pattern of behavior. Because sometimes on our teams, there's always that person who, you know, makes people uncomfortable with the kinds of comments that they make. And oftentimes we think that they're only talking like that to one person. Um, and that person also doesn't realize that what they are doing is making everybody uncomfortable. And so if you're able to, so it's easy for them to dismiss one person's um, feelings and say, well, you just feel that way about it. But it's important to get a sense of how everybody's feeling about and show it to that person to say, actually, like, you're making everybody sort of feel uncomfortable um, with this behavior um, as a way to challenge this idea that it's only one person's problem. Um, also really important to show solidarity to those on the receiving end. I find a lot of times when microaggressions happen, people who are around don't know what to do, even though they can tell somebody feels uncomfortable. And it's important to um, show that solidarity, you know, even if it's after you can say to that person, you know, I noticed this thing happened. I wanted to let you know that like I felt uncomfortable about it too. Next time, how would you like me to, to support you in this? Would you like me to say something? Would you like me to talk to that person? Um, showing that solidarity doesn't always mean speaking up right there and then, even though that's important as well, but not everybody is comfortable doing that. But it's also like it really important to show people that you understand and that you're willing to show up for them if they would like you to. It's important that you check yourself, right? Um, uh, again, like most of us don't realize when we're engaging in this kind in these kinds of microaggressions. And so it's important for you to, to, to check yourself when you do. And if you notice that somebody has now tensed up or their body language has changed um, or, you know, they didn't last 
and all of those kinds of things, like you might want to just say, you know what, I think the thing I said was offended you. Um, like create that space for the person to tell you, because like I said, most people are not going to tell you that, that you, you offended them if it's a microaggression, but if you create that space um, by noticing that you did it, and then saying like, you know, I think I did do, I think I might've offended you. Like, you know, do you want to have a conversation about it? Creating the space for the person to tell you actually what happened in that situation is also important. Um, I have here, don't laugh, because oftentimes there's an, an uncomfortable kind of laughter that happens because we don't know how else to react. To react. Um, important to, to not laugh, right? Just if, it, if it's not, a, if it's supposed to be a joke and it's not funny, like, just don't laugh about it because sometimes that laughing reaffirms um, that, you know, this is something, this, this behavior is okay. Um, and it's important to ask questions when people sort of like make assumptions about you, right? So somebody's like, well, let's go get some jerk chicken. And then you're like, well, why would I, why would you offer me jerk chicken? Why would I like jerk chicken? Um, what does it mean to sound white? If somebody says, well, you sound white, what does it mean to sound white? What does it mean to speak well, right? Asking those questions back to that person is often a good way to get them to see how the thing that they've said is, is about a stereotype that they have, something that they have assumed about you, right? And so it's important to sort of like ask those questions as well. Um, so I'm at the end of the, the presentation. Um, I wanted to leave 10 minutes um, for us to be able to engage in dialogue and have and, and just answer some questions. Um, and I wanted to revisit this chart that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation around um, you know, where you are on this journey and being able to sort of like locate yourself on this journey. Um, because I think it's really important again to do that work and to determine, you know, what how how do we actually become anti-racist? Um, how do we get to this place? And so I wanted to end with this chart as well. Uh, just for folks to to be able to continue thinking about this piece in terms of how do we individually from our different positions think about being anti-racist, right? What is in your job description? How do you think about the work that you do day to day um, in an intentional way that is not colorblind, right? That thinks about how does this particular thing that I do in my job impact other people differently? How does this thing that I do at home impact other people differently? And all of those kinds of pieces and asking ourselves those questions. Um, so I wanted to, I, I'll end there and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, so I can sort of see the chat and just uh, we can spend some time, some time having a conversation. Amazing, so much going on in the chat. So encourage people okay. to keep throwing your comments there. Evelyn, I've got about five points that I'm going to try to relay to you that have come up so far. And Tara, okay. I don't know if you can keep an eye out for maybe some additional ones where people can put their hands up. So uh, earlier on, a comment about the faith religion experience of discrimination, some uh, noting that there's some interesting research coming out in that space. Um, I think perhaps just an invitation, if Evelyn, if you want to add any comments to um, discrimination as it ties to faith and religion. Yeah, that is such a, yeah. <laughs> I saw a really interesting meme um, in relation to that. I forgot exactly what it said, but it's really important. I think that um, there's a way in which like, uh, like folks will use religion as a way to discriminate. Um, uh, and, you know, and even if we saw sort of like in our, elect our elections, um, just you know, with with the provincial elections, where you saw that there was a way that relig um, religious beliefs were 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 used as a way to um, you know push a kind of agenda of, against folks that are queer, right, and folks from the LGBTQ community. And so then you had people voting against their own interests, right, because of like the way religion played into that kind of conversation, which I thought was really interesting. And you see it kind of continue. Um, if you look over even to the the U.S. election. Um, and the way that uh, being conservative for folks translates into being religious. Um, but then that kind of behavior also is like very, um, uh, it's racist, right? Like that's what, what ends up happening. And so, yeah, that's something that's interesting too. And, you know, we can't, I, I don't think we can get into it more in depth, but thanks for, for raising that, that comment. Great. Um, do you have an example of a positive prejudice? Um, 
yeah, I know I said that uh, prejudices can be positive. They're not really, but you know, I've seen, so, so sometimes people will say stuff like, um, where you'll see folks who are, for example, Asian get hired in jobs that are in finance, because there's an assumption that folks that are Asian are good at math. Right. And so they're, they're more likely to get that kind of job, um, or, uh, folks who are, you know, or like, if you're black and tall, you must be good at some sort of sport. Right. So you're more likely to, to so even though it's, it's positive in a way, it ends up actually uh, very much restricting the opportunities that a lot of people have, um, mm-hmm. particularly if somebody is not interested in playing basketball. Right. So we, we've noticed that with streaming um, in high schools, you have um, guidance counselors and teachers that will stream young people into places based off of these kinds of prejudices. Right. Even when that's not what they want to do. And so it does actually, you know, even though it has this sort of positive impact, it has a negative impact as well. Mm. And I'm going to skip down a bit on my list because I think this question kind of ties. It circles back to the reverse racism uh, commentary earlier. So the example that this person wondered about was uh, a job a hiring situation, two candidates, both considered equally qualified, um, and, and the offer going first to the racialized individual. Um, and this person's explaining for the need to, quote, check a box or um, because they're looking for multicultural representation. Yeah. I'm curious mm-hmm. your thoughts on how you would address this claim. So that's, that's not reverse racism, actually. So if you look at um, the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, actually the Ontario Human Rights Code allows for special programs that aim to remove barriers for groups that have been historically um, left out of spaces. Um, and so that's actually a right that is guaranteed under the Ontario Human Rights Code that then says that, so you can look that up, that then says that that's not reverse racism if you do give it to the person, if the person that's racialized, and it's not just folks that are racialized, it's also women. It's also um, folks who are uh, living with a disability and those kinds of things. If you privilege those folks um, in jobs, it's not a, a form of any kind of reverse oppression or anything because that that provision in the Ontario Human Rights Code is tr- is taking that not colorblind approach that I was talking about in relation to that, right? So um, as long as the person is qualified and can do the job, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's really, it, it, it's actually okay and, and encouraged, right? Because what we know is that historically, um, if you look at different sectors, different groups of people have been intentionally kept out of those sectors. And so now there are provisions and policies that are in place that allow to increase that representation. And that's not, re- that's not reverse racism. An important clarification. Thank you, Evelyn. The other two, um, there's been some back and forth in the chat. And so I think it's more um, people offering comments. So I'll just offer them into your uh, awareness as well. So one person uh, noting Bromf and Brenner's ecological model, um, which is that model, you know, talk about the micro and the meso and the macro and talking about the value I think that comes when we bring the conversation of racism out from just the macro and seeing it as within all the different layers. And I think we had some yeah. good comments back and forth in the chat of people recognizing the need and the importance of that. So if you yeah. have anything yeah. to add. No, that's perfect. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and the other comment that people um, are reflecting themselves on the ways in which they're being vocal with uh, conversations they have, relationships they have, but their, um, their pull to be more vocal with authorities, decision makers, when they uh, know about racism, when they see discrimination, um, so that it is more uh, talked about and shared about. Yeah. And I think that's, I think somebody just made a comment saying that's why it's, it's important to hire, um, you know, racialized Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, because then you are able to actually, you know, a lot of us don't get these things because of who's around us, right? We don't get the information. We don't know about the experiences. So we do often think about it from a high level. We think it doesn't show up in our own lives or it doesn't show up in our own workplaces, but you're not going to know that it does if you don't have other people around you. And that's not to say, sorry, I, and, and I always want to make the separation that I don't think that when you have racialized people at your workplace, they should be tasked with doing all the race work. 
right? Like that's not, that's also not like an okay model, especially if that person wasn't hired to do that job specifically. So if you didn't hire somebody who's black and racialized to be the diversity equity person, just because they are on your team doesn't mean they should be tasked with doing that work. Um, they, because it still requires a level of expertise that not everybody has, but also it's just not fair that they are expected to come to work and talk to ev and educate people about, you know, everything that has to do with race. No white person ever has to go to work and educate everybody on anything that white people do, right? Like that's not an expectation that white people have of, of other white people, but sometimes it's an expectation that we put on folks that are racialized um, and, and it's a completely unfair thing to do. Uh, so it is. So while it's important to have a diverse workforce, um, so you're getting other perspectives, um, it's also important to not only put that task and that work on those folks, right? It's also important for us to, um, for everybody to develop that competency to be able to respond, deal with racism, all of those kinds of things, because that's part of why we end up having these conversations about race every few years because we all don't see it as our responsibility we see it as something that other people are supposed to do like it doesn't have to do with my work etc but we all have to see it as showing up in all of our work especially if we work with and serve people I mean it, to me it's really ridiculous that we work in diverse or we serve diverse populations but we're trying but we don't feel like we should also be competent in this thing. Like we all have to see it as part of our work and our responsibility, not just the one diversity person's job in terms of doing approaching this work. Thank you. We only have a couple moments left, Tara. Are you noticing other comments to be made or questions? Um, I think we have a lot of comments and questions, but I guess <laughs> so one, one that just come up is, you know, just kind of back to the history of racism in, in Canada and how it is, you know, it has been founded in law. Um, do you have suggestions for like, for folks like us who are working together as collectives, how can we help with the awareness raising about this? So I think workshops like this are really, are really good for folks. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I really uh, think that workplaces should work towards are toolkits that are relevant to their particular industry. Um, and so what I what um, I, I do for a lot of organizations is I'll so let's say you're in youth work, I will I will create a toolkit that's directly related uh, with resources and stuff to like to youth work, especially the more difficult industries where folks don't see the intersection like finance, right? What I was mentioning, like I'll work with, with teams to be able to create a toolkit for them that asks specific questions, that points to specific histories, that allow people to see from their position, you know, how does this show up in my work or how does this show up in, 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 the, in the industry that we work in? Um, really interesting. I, I did a, a workshop and a toolkit for uh, folks that are in um, uh, design, um, sorry, in, um, uh, um, what is it? Yeah, like in design, right? Like in terms of designing houses and designing like different things, like how the, what, how the history of racism show up in even those spaces, right? Because it's like, these are the places where we don't think they show up, but they do and they still impact the way people experience life. And so I think that's probably something that you can endeavor to do is to develop a toolkit that's specific to your, to the work that you do. Um, so it allows people to make the, the connections fairly clearly and easily in terms of how it shows up in your work. Awesome. So it's now 1151. <laughs> I think we've run out of time. Um, Allison, maybe I'll just say a quick thank you, Evelyn. Like this has been amazing. And I don't know if you're watching the chat at all, but the feedback is amazing from everybody just in terms of the breadth of topics that you have covered, the clarity that you have brought to them, the examples that you have given that make them real and actionable for everyone. Um, we really appreciate you coming to spend time with us today. And I'd also just like to thank all of our partners um, for joining us today in this collective journey and to the Children's News Planning Table for doing this together with us at the Immigration Partnership. You know, this is important work and, you know, we are on a journey and we're glad to be on it together with you um, as we're, you know, trying to impact things, you know, in the same community. So this has been amazing and I am looking forward to doing more things like this in the future. Yes, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for the comments and stuff. I'm happy that the information resonated with folks and I'm happy that, um, you know, you're seeing the, some, some actionable 
things because uh, that's my goal in any of the sessions that I do. Um, and so thank you and, and, you know, good luck on the journey and hopefully um, uh, maybe we'll be have another session. Not sure. But yeah, so take care, everyone. Um, and thanks for, for sticking with me throughout the last couple of hours. And just a reminder, the session today has been recorded. Evelyn, I know there's a couple folks that are crossing their fingers in hopes that you might share the slides from your presentation. And I yeah. don't know you can follow up with us on that if you uh Okay. Yeah. I normally that. don't only because there's a lot that I explain. Um and so if you were in the session, I'm more likely to share it with you. But I wouldn't if it's for folks who weren't in the session, I don't know if it's that useful. But if it's folks that are in the session that want the slides, then I'm happy to share it. Um, that's the only that's the only way that I think about it. So okay. we can talk after Allison um, and Sarah around that. Thank you again so much. Okay. Thanks everyone right. Take for care. being here. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.